We have a, a really fantastic panel uh, this evening bringing um, together three aspects of, of wearable tech. Uh, health and fitness, which I believe drove the first wave, and we'll talk about that. Uh, represented by Esther Rodriguez Villas, uh, co-founder of Imperial Spinout AccuPebble. Uh, this is a device. I'm going to ask them each to pitch this very, very, pitch their ideas very, very briefly, as they would to a VC in just a second. But my take is a device that analyzes the body's sounds to detect illness uh, is is uh, is that is your product, uh, Esther. Um, Jack Hooper is co-founder of Doppel. We were expecting someone else from Doppel, but we're delighted to have Jack uh, here uh, instead. Uh, I've heard Doppel described in many ways, perhaps the best, um, a psychophysiology wearable for people who want to influence how they're feeling by using a tactile rhythm. I don't know who came up with that one, but I'm interested. <laughs> I'm in <laughs> snappy, yeah. I'm interested to hear your, your take on it. Um, and his passion is how Doppel's technology um, uh, can change one's mood and, and how, how that can then transform the workplace. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that as well. And, and last but not least is Diogo uh, Coutinho, uh, Director for Product Innovation at Vinaya Technologies, the connected jewelry startup aimed at promoting uh, emotional well-being. He's also, I'm told, an AI fanatic and and we have done, um, we've talked a lot about AI in for this series as well. I don't know if any of you were at the, the Steve Ferber talk last year. Now, we, we, of course, we've got some, some, some big topics to throw around, personal data and privacy, ethics, um, the importance of design, uh, which you'll, you'll see as well later when you take a look at that stuff, um, applications in the workplace. But let, let me ask you this to start with, and, and any of you just, just, just jump in. Apple Watch, and again, I'm wearing a layperson's hat here. Apple Watch, Samsung Gear, Google Glass. From where I'm sitting, none of those products are gaining th that much traction that quickly. Is it fair to say that? And, and if, if so, why do you think that is? I mean, that's, there's lots of complex reasons why, but I think the key one is they don't have a purpose. OK. Yet. There's... Um, the smartwatches are essentially just a new interface for your phone. Um, I mean, I'm sure they will find their application. I'm sure they're relying, as they did with smartphones, <coughs> on being a platform technology um, that then other people will create amazing uses mm. for. Mm. Um, I mean, then <coughs> there's also there's fashion, there's yep. uh, battery life, there's all sorts of... Yeah. So, so, so I, guess, I guess the question, and uh, Esther, let me put this to you, wh whether a world um, in which we're permanently connected via wearable tech can ever really be compatible with privacy, and whether that actually matters at the end of the day. Well, that's, that's, <laughs> that's it's actually true. Does that actually matter in the sense that we, are, okay, so we, we are creating a medical technology, and of course, as a medical technology, we face issues that are um, uh, even more complex than the, the ones that you could be facing here, despite the fact that we don't need personal data. So personal data, at the end of the day, is something that can identify a person. That's the definition of personal data. Mm -hmm. Physiological mm -hmm. signals are not actually personal data. But because people are, this is the interesting thing, I yeah. think people are totally uneducated about this. So I had once an interesting anecdote. No, it wasn't with Acupable, it was with something else that we, we are creating in my lab, which is a brain monitoring system. And uh, we were using some anonymized brainwave signals, electrical signals. And uh, someone said that, uh, you know, we had to go through an ethics committee because, and I said, what, wait a minute, we just have electrical signals from somebody's brain and there is no link at all to who this person was. And you cannot get from the, your signals who was that person. And, uh, and this person told me, and we are talking of an educated person, yeah, but you could eventually create algorithms that are able to read what you were thinking at that point. <laughs> Well, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> not you, really. you don't think we'll ever get to yeah, that point? No, I <laughs> don't think yeah. we are Steve ever going to get to that point. Steve Ferber on AI might disagree with At least in this life. You disagree as well. <laughs> do you? Okay. In, the, in this life, no, we are not going to get to that. Eventually, we might, but 
by that time, you know what, well, there will be no new laws and we will th this world we have other problems. Right. So no, we are not going to get there anytime soon. Let, let me, uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but let me ask it this way. What, what excites the VCs and the people you've been pitching to uh, about this product? Is it that? You know, what do they see? What do these guys sitting behind the, the, the tables, the investors, mm -hmm. what do they see as the, the big deal about this product? The big deal is that it's a, a fundamentally new way to look at and think about technology. So it's not just saying there's a rational job that needs doing. <coughs> it's about saying, can this, I mean, which is a, a form of, you know, human enhancement in mm -hmm. a way, mm -hmm. but it's looking at it saying, can you actually help enhance people and help them do what they want to do them to themselves so it's it's a different way of looking at technology and it's actually looking at it from a fundamentally human human perspective mm. let me ask you is you know we've got three companies here uk uh, you're all based in the uk is is london starting um to be noticed in the wear wearable tech world you know against the googles the apples the samsungs etc is it a good place to be <coughs> um i mean it's, it's difficult to say. I think uh, there's still, in, in London in terms, of, it depends in, in what sense. It's a good place in that it's, it's in Europe, which is sort of fa from a f fashion perspective, that's a good thing. Mm. Um, I think there are more companies that are starting here and they are starting to get more funding and they are starting to be noticed, but it's still nothing like the scale that's coming out of the US mm. um, or in, in China as well in terms of the, I mean, they're it's so they're massively successful, um, even if they're doing things that are actually at the other end of the scale. Yeah, the very other end of the scale. Very. But good. I guess my question is: Do you, if you're going to set up a business like this, do you want to do it in the UK or do you want to do it in the US? Uh, I mean, I think the fund. So, from a funding perspective, um, there's more funds that understand the challenges of hardware in the US. I agree with that. And th th that brings me on to something very interesting that you mentioned before we came in here as well, and this is aligning academia with industry and how, I, I was going to say how easy that is here, it's how difficult that is here, right? Because it is, it is still a real challenge that is. Yeah, well, that is something that Europe needs to work out, how to do better. I mean, Europe is not just here, it's, the, it's in, in the whole of the continent. They need to learn from the US. So the technology transfer models in the US are different to what we have here. The universities claim much more ownership on, on, on inventions that they claim in the US. And of course, by organizations claiming more ownership, there is less motivation for entrepre entrepreneurs coming from mm. university. Mm. Mm. It's not the case if you are a student, uh, because students, as long as they haven't worked, they have worked independently at least here they own the, the intellectual property, but if by any chance you have been working as a paid member of a staff, uh, then they, they, they retain the ownership of the IP. So of course, I mean, if you are gonna start, uh, start a business, it's a very, very big undertaking. So you need to have a mm -hmm. massive drive to do it, and that drive is attenuated in Europe by the fact that you don't have access to the IP you created to start with. So. Uh, that's not the case in the US, okay. which is why lots of successful business come out of universities, yeah. and you don't see that in Europe yeah. that much. Yeah. Mm -hmm.